Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm back, and I'm finally going to start writing Verilog code for multiplying two 16-bit floating-point numbers. If this is the first video from this series which you have seen, you may want to watch the previous videos before watching this one. In the upper right-hand corner of your screen is a link to the playlist for this video series. The prior videos give background on myself, floating-point numbers, and how the floating-point values are categorized. If you're not already familiar with the details of the IEEE 754 standard, you should probably go back and watch the earlier videos first. In this video, I'm calling the module HPMOL. Before the Verilog code can perform the actual multiplication, it has to determine what kind of values were passed into the module. For this, I'm using the HP class module, which was written and tested in the two previous videos. The HP class module outputs six 1-bit flags. I'll need two sets of these flags, one set for each of the two input values, so I declare them here, and then I need to wire the two input values and their output flags up to two instances of the HP class module. After determining the value types for the two input values, there is an always block. If you're new to Verilog, the at parentheses asterisk expression is the sensitivity list for the always block. I've used a wildcard, the asterisk, so if any of the input values changes, the always block recomputes all the values in the block. Before adding code to the inside of the always block, there's one more thing I need. A temporary value to hold the product. I'm calling this ptemp. Inside the always block, I'm going to start by initializing ptemp to a unique signaling NAND value. This will be useful to help us ensure that we've covered all the possible cases for the various pairs of input values. For those who are new to Verilog, allow me to describe the syntax of what is written here. The value being assigned to ptemp is a bit vector. Starting inside the curly braces is the expression 1 apostrophe b0. The 1 apostrophe says that the value being described is one bit wide. The letter B says that the digits which follow are binary digits, that is, the digits which follow will only be zeros or ones. And the final zero says that the single bit in this value is set to zero. Skipping past the comma, the next expression is left brace 5, left brace, 1 apostrophe B1, right brace, right brace. In the heart of the expression is the sub-expression 1 apostrophe B1. You've probably already guessed that this specifies a 1-bit value, which is initialized to 1. The curly braces and the number 5 represent a replication operation. They take the bit vector in the heart of the expression and replicate it 5 times. The output of this expression is a bit vector, which is 5 bits wide, and all the bits in this vector are set to 1. This expression could have been written in a simpler way. For example, I could have written 5 apostrophe B 11111. Or I could have written the hexadecimal equivalent using 5 apostrophe H 1F. For now, why I don't use these other expressions is unimportant, but I promise I will come back to them later. The next value is another 1 bit vector initialized to 0, and following that is a 9 bit vector which has all of its bits initialized to 1, but you probably guessed that already. These four sub-expressions are separated by commas and enclosed in curly braces. This concatenates the four bit vectors into one vector which is 16 bits wide. Again, I could have just written 16 apostrophe 1111 from the very beginning and been done with it. But at this point you can begin to see that for the 32, 64, and 128-bit floating point formats that counting out the correct number of digits and organizing them in the correct sequence of zeros and ones would be both tedious and error prone. This isn't a full explanation of why I use the bit vector replication and concatenation operations, but it should be enough to allay your puzzlement until later. The next statement initializes all the one bit output flags to zero. Please note that at the end of the module one of these flags must be set to one and the rest must be set to zero. If we reach the end of the module and this condition isn't met, we have an error. 
We need to remember this later when we write our test bench code for this module. This table serves as a checklist of various combinations of the input values A, our multiplicand, and B, our multiplier. Let's begin working our way through the checklist. I've described how to detect NANDs, but I haven't discussed how the IEEE standard says they're to be handled when they're encountered by a conforming implementation. For NANDs, the standard says that most operations propagate quiet NANDs without signaling exceptions and signal the invalid operation exception when given a signaling NAND operand. If we're trying to multiply a quiet NAND, the standard says to propagate it, that is, return the quiet NAND as the product of the multiplication. Being able to signal an exception in the case of an SNAND being passed as an operand to the multiply module assumes that there is a CPU which can process that exception. I'm developing the multiply module as a standalone piece of code. Eventually someone could incorporate the module into an actual FPU or CPU and then there would be some infrastructure for handling the exception. Until that happens I'm going to treat signaling NANDs the same way quiet NANDs are handled. I'm going to make the module propagate the SNAN. This first if statement tests to see if either of the input operands is a signaling NAN. If one or both of them is a signaling NAN, we set ptemp to the value of the signaling NAN and set the SNAN output flag for the product to be true. The code for handling quiet NANs is virtually the same. These two if clauses complete the first two full rows and columns of our checklist. The next item on our checklist is infinity. There are three easy cases here. Infinity times infinity is infinity. Infinity times any non-zero number is also infinity, so infinity times subnormal numbers and infinity times normal numbers also yields a product of infinity, but you knew that already. The odd case here is what does it mean to multiply infinity by zero? If you want to know the full answer to that, you need to take a course in calculus, seriously. A brief summary is that infinity times zero can be infinity, zero, a finite number, or completely undefined. It's for cases like this that the IEEE 754 standard defines the NAND values. In cases like this, the standard says that the result of the operation is a quiet NAN, but the standard doesn't specify any more than that, although it does give some hints, which we might consider. Section 6.2 of the standard says quiet NANs should, by means left to the implementer's discretion, afford retrospective diagnostic information inherited from invalid or unavailable data and results. To facilitate propagation of diagnostic information contained in NANDs as much as possible should be preserved in NAND results of operations. So, if we're going to return a quiet NAND, what should we make it look like? To be a quiet NAND, all the exponent bits must be 1. And at least bit 9 of the significand must be 1. The sign bit and bits 0 through 8 of the significand are completely under our control. We could do something simple by making all the unspecified bits zero. Technically, that's within the spec. Or we could set bits zero through six of the significand to the hexadecimal value 2a. Or we could set bits zero through seven to either hexadecimal b7 or d7. Why these values? Hexadecimal 2a is the ASCII code for the asterisk character. In most programming languages, including Verilog, Asterisks are used as the multiplication operator. The hexadecimal values B7 and D7 are Latin 1 codes for the two multiplication symbols you see displayed on the screen. If one is going to encode this information into the NAND value for the product, I'm inclined to use the ASCII value just because it's the most universal. Even countries which don't speak English generally use ASCII encodings. Non-English speaking countries are less likely to use Latin 1. There's one minor bit I haven't yet addressed, the sign bit. When we multiply infinity times infinity, a subnormal or a normal number, how do we get the sign bit? This works pretty much like you would expect. The IEEE standard specifies that when neither the inputs nor result are NAN, the sign of a product is the exclusive OR of the operand signs. We need a place to save the result because we'll need it for other cases besides this one. 
I declared the reg P sign and added a statement to initialize P sign in the same place the code initializes P temp. The code which handles multiplying by infinity looks like this. If you choose not to encode the multiplication and operation symbol into the NAND, there's a simpler way to write the code. Here I use the value of the QNAND flag to control bit 9 of the result and to determine what value is stored in the infinity flag. With the infinity case out of the way, our checklist is now down to this. The next case is trivially easy. Multiplying by 0. 0 times 0, 0 times a subnormal number, and 0 times a normal number is obviously 0. Remember that the IEEE standard supports both positive and negative zero, so when constructing our zero value, we have to use the value of P sign in our final result. Having completed multiplying by zero, our checklist is getting really close to being completed. Here I'd like to point out something. I've said virtually nothing about how to interpret either the exponent field or the significant field for either subnormal or normal numbers, and yet I've been able to write Verilog code to deal with 32 of the possible 36 cases. But my back is finally against the wall, and I have to go into how normal and subnormal numbers work. There are some significant details which need to be covered in the description of how normal and subnormal numbers are encoded before I can finish writing the Verilog code. For that reason, I'm going to wrap up here and postpone that discussion until our next exciting episode. Questions and comments are welcome in the comment section below. If you found this video useful, please click like. While you're at it, subscribe to the channel, then click the bell to be notified when new videos are available. Thanks.